Think we have everyone? All right. So uh, my name is Frederick Tobeson. I'm with Los Alamos National Lab. Um, so this is, uh, uh, Los Alamos is a fairly large uh, government uh, laboratory in the US. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with Los Alamos in New Mexico and can point it out on a map. Um, if you can't, just go and look it up afterwards. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm glad I came here early this week and saw some of the talks that, that uh, were presented. So you've already seen several talks that had to do with uh, sort of the, the general topics of fission and different nuclear reactions. Um, so I was going to focus these two lectures this morning on um, just going over the different uh, experimental programs for nuclear data that we have at Los Alamos. So I'm not really going to go into a general discussion on um, the nuclear reactions or, or um, the general physics topics, but try to focus on capabilities and the instruments, um, both on the um, neutron production side and also the instruments we use for nuclear data measurements. Um, we have uh, two times one and a half hour, so feel free to interrupt me and uh, ask questions as we go. I'm going to not only bore you over these three hours, but I'm going to bore myself if I'm the only one speaking in here, so please ask me questions. Uh, and this is not going to work. All right, so I'm just going to give you a sort of an uh, introduction and talk about why we do nuclear data measurements at Los Alamos and um, what are our strengths and, and what are some of the weaknesses with our program. Um, and then I'm going to talk about the LANS facility, Los Alamos Neutron Science Center, uh, which is where we do our, our research. And we actually have, well, we have several facilities out at LANS, but the two that are neutron uh, facilities are the Luan Center which traditionally has been used for material science research. And we have the Weapons Neutron Research Facility, where we make fast neutrons and do more of the traditional nuclear science or nuclear data measurements. Although we also use the Luan Center, and especially recently we used that facility for nuclear science measurements as well. Um, and then much of our, our recent program is focused on fission in different ways. So I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about uh, our fission work. Um, I'm going to start with cross-section measurements. That's um, what uh, I've started with when I came to Los Alamos. Uh, and then talk about another project where we look at the prompt fission neutron spectrum for plutonium in this case. Uh, and then fission product yields is another big business and something that we've um, started up and done a lot of work on in the last sort of uh, uh, three to five years. Um, total kinetic energy release in fission is another uh, recent topic. Um, and then I'm going to talk about some of the other capabilities. Neutron capture measurements and uh, neutron-induced light charged particle reactions, and that's something where we're just developing the capability. Um, but there's been some measurements that are actually starting up uh, in the last few weeks. I'm also going to mention some things that aren't really nuclear data that we do uh, at LANS uh, towards the very end here. Okay, so you had almost two weeks now on nuclear data, so you know why you want to measure nuclear data. Um, one good reason is for uh, nuclear energy technology. And um, I really like nuclear power. I think that's a great energy source. So uh, um, I think it's worthwhile measuring the nuclear data we need for reactor applications. Um, and if you want to do new and advanced reactor technology, uh, you need a new type of nuclear data. So with new reactors, you need higher precision. And if you do a fast reactor, for example, you care about the different neutron energy range than you would do in a thermal system. And you can also save money uh, by improving the data. Um, you can lower your safety margins if you know better the, the different nuclear uh, cross-sections and nuclear data that goes into simulating the system. Um, there's the uh, global security aspect. 
Um, we use nuclear data to uh, look at different schemes for uh, nuclear forensics, for example. So that's another um, basic uh, motivation for us, and uh, nuclear non-proliferation. And then, okay, of, of course, fundamental science. Um, nuclear st we do nuclear structure research in our group, uh, and there is a strong nuclear astrophysics program, and we go after capture cross-sections and other uh, nuclear data in order to better understand the origin of the heavy elements in the universe. Okay, so why do those measurements uh, at LANO? Some of those measurements at LANO. So first of all, uh, our institution, it's part of our mission. As part of our mission, we're supposed to measure nuclear data. It impacts our global security missions, and our uh, energy security missions. Now, one of the nice um, things about being at Los Alamos is that we uh, bring together uh, very many very different uh, types of expertise in this field. So we do experiments, but we also have a strong theory and evaluation group. In fact, a lot of the people that uh, do the X4, or sorry, the ENDF evaluation files uh, are at Los Alamos and um, do at least in the, in the fast range a lot of uh, cross-section and capture evaluations. We also have uh, our colleagues that work on the uh, benchmarking of the data and we have the uh, end users of the data, the people that actually take our data and um, use that in calculations. So um, when you do measurements or do experiments at Los Alamos, you have a chance to actually go uh, up to the next building and talk to some of the people that do the evaluation. And that's usually how you convince them that your measurement is better than the other guy's measurement. And they take your, your data and weight that differently in the evaluation. I'm not saying it should work that way, but that's actually how it, how it usually is. Um, when I was a graduate student and, and measured a cross section, I think it took five years before it showed up in, in X4. And when you're, since I came to Los Alamos, when we do a measurement, it usually shows up in the library the next uh, few months or so. So, um, so our measurement program uh, has the advantage of having a, a rather nice neutron source, the LANS facility. And I'll show you some, some detail about that facility. Um, it's, I think, one of three spallation neutron sources uh, that do where you do nuclear science uh, in the world. So there's Los Alamos, there's uh, Entof, of course, that we hear about this afternoon, and PMPI in Russia. And I think those are the only places we really do nuclear science with spallation sources. All the other spallation sources are used for material science. Um, we have the ability to handle radioactive samples, um, plutonium and, and heavier uh, samples, something you cannot always do at a university. Entoff, of course, now have the capability to do plutonium targets, which is very nice, so we can do uh, comparisons in, in some of the measurements there. Um, we've also invested heavily in new instruments. Um, some of the types of instruments that were previously mostly used in high energy physics, we're now applying to nuclear physics programs. And we have a long tradition of doing measurements, so you have um, you know, your fellow um, scientists that have been there since the 40s or so. Uh, so there's a lot of expertise to pull from. Um, I thought I should mention, just because there's some misconceptions out there, we do like to collaborate. So you can actually come to Los Alamos and do experiments and, and uh, collaborate with us. For some reason, some people think that it's um, prohibited because of security concerns or so, and, and that's not true. So LANS is actually a user facility. We have a lot of hundreds of users coming in every year to do experiments there, both from universities, national laboratories, and from industry. And I'll actually show you a little bit at the end of this uh, about the industry program that we have. Um, almost all of the projects we do are in collaboration with other institutions. So um, almost all of the experiments I'm going to talk about we do together with some, some universities in the US or international collaborations. 
the CEA in France, uh, all kinds of places. Uh, and we do have both domestic and international collaborators. All right, so here's a, an overview of, of lands. So um, Los Alamos is sitting up on these so-called mesa tops in New Mexico. So first of all, it's not the desert. That's what I thought when I came there, and, and it's not. We actually have really good skiing there. Um, so the southern part of the state is, is a desert, but this is kind of a green area. So if you see the aerial overview of lands there, that's one of these mesa tops or plateaus. Um, and so the town of Los Alamos and all the areas around there are up on these uh, plateaus. They were kind of nice when they built the lab there because it was very difficult to get there. And so you just have to close off one road and then you're protected against access from, from people getting to the lab. So um, this is the, the lens facility. Here is the 800 MeV proton accelerator. So we have an 800 MeV uh, LINAC. And that drives a few different facilities. We have isotope production for medical isotopes. So that happens at the sort of pre-acceleration stage of the accelerator. Um, we have an ultra-cold neutron experiment facility. Proton radiography, where you actually image uh, things using protons. Things that uh, happens very quickly and you need a fast um, camera. To, to image them. But what I'm going to talk about are the WNR and Luan Center facility where we make neutrons. So at both of those facilities, we use the spallation process um, with tungsten targets and, and make neutrons. So what happens is that the, so here's the, the red here is the proton beam. You know, protons are red and neutrons are blue, right? So this is the proton beam. Uh, here is the Luan Center. At the Luan center, you have the proton beam coming in uh, and being bent down, so the proton beam comes in from the top. And you have these two tungsten targets where the proton beam goes through both of them without stopping. Um, so you make neutrons there, and then um, that target assembly is surrounded by different types of moderators, so you get different types of moderated spectrums. Um, so at this facility, you have some flight paths that are very short. It's kind of difficult to see here, probably. So back here, you have flight paths that have sort of 8, 10 meter flight path. And then on this side, you have stations that are more like 20, 25, 30 meters flight path lengths. Um, there's something like 20 flight paths or so available there. And up until about a year ago, Almost all of them were running material science instrument neutron scattering experiments, and three were uh, dedicated to nuclear science. So we had some um, changes over the last year. The, the uh, neutron scattering program lost much of its funding, uh, and that's because the Oak Ridge facility is now doing most of the neutron scattering work in the US. So this year, we actually just started running this facility um, a few weeks ago, and now we have three uh, material science flight paths and three nuclear science flight paths. So that, that place has really changed quite a bit. And then over at WNR, we, so, so as I said, this is a moderated target. And then at WNR, we just have a bare spallation target. So it's, it's, it's a very simple target. You have a can of uh, tungsten, Wolfram. And it's just cooled with water. Uh, and we make high energy spallation neutrons, and, and you get a spectrum from, um, well, you get a spectrum from, from low energies up all the way to hundreds of MeV. Because of the pole structure, you can only use certain energies. So at the Luan Center, you get uh, 20 hertz repetition, repetition rate. So you have plenty of time to measure neutron time of flight between pulses. So you can go down to thermal or subthermal energies. Uh, and that's because we take the proton um, beam and uh, compress it in a storage ring. Um, so you bunch up several pulses, and then you get this long term between, between pulses. At WNR, you actually deliver beam with 100 hertz repetition rate, but each um, pulse has a micro -stru pulse structure. 
So what you do is you measure time of flight over 1.8 microseconds between these pulses. So with that pulse structure, you can only go down to sort of 100 kV roughly. Uh, and then um, going up, you go to hundreds of MeV of neutron energy. So um, this is the neutron spectrum for those two facilities. So this part here is the Luan Center, one of the flight paths. Of course, it depends on which flight path you're on because they have different moderators. Um, this is flight path 12, where we do it's kind of like a general use nuclear science flight path. And the thermal bump there uh, is reduced because we had a dead acquisition system that couldn't handle the fission. This is for a fission experiment. We couldn't handle the rate at thermals. We only took some of the pulses. <coughs> so this is actually a count rate estimate for one of our experiments. But yeah, so there you get an, a large uh, thermal bump. And then you can do measurements out to 200, 300 kV or so. And at that point, you really start losing resolution. Um, the, the pulse that gets delivered to WNR is 250, I'm sorry, to Leon Center is 250 nanoseconds. So by the time you're out to hundreds of kV, you have very poor resolution. So that's a major difference compared to ENTO, for example. We have this excellent resolution in the kV, hundreds of kV region. Um, and then if you move over to the WNR facility, this is the spectrum there. Um, again, you go down to sort of 100 or um, 200 kV, and there's a small overlap region. So if you want to do a measurement and cover this whole energy range, you do one measurement at Luron, one at WNR, you have a small overlap region, and you get a continuous cross-section from low to very high energies. And we've used that for many of our uh, fission cross-section measurements. Again, at the end of, you can do that without having to do it in two facilities. You just do one measurement from thermal up to uh, hundreds of MeV, and we do not have that capability. Okay, so we have several different instruments that we use for nuclear science research. And I'm going to talk about uh, many of these. We have the time projection chamber, the TPC, which is a fancy ionization chamber that we use for fission cross-section measurements. Um, I think there's an expression in Swedish about shooting elephants with a, no, shooting mosquitoes with an elephant gun or something like that. It's kind of overkill to have a TPC to measure cross-sections. So we do some other uh, fun physics studies with this instrument as well. Can you, which is the uh, neutron array where we measure the prompt fission neutron spectrum. Um, and that's an ongoing project as well. The dance array, which is at the Lewin Center, we will look at neutron capture uh, measurements using a, a color, calorimeter detector. Um, Genie, which is actually now decommissioned, but that was used for um, um, things like measuring the end-to-end cross-section in plutonium, so looking at uh, gamma rays from different reactions. SPIDER, which is a 2E, 2V instrument, kind of like the uh, Cosi Fantutti spectrometer that existed at the ELL back in the 80s. Um, so Stefan talked a little about these types of techniques um, yesterday, and this is for measuring fission product yields. And then Apollo is actually an instrument that is not being used for experiments at Los Alamos, but it's something um, that we been developed for doing inverse kinematics measurements um, at the EFRIB facility when that comes online. Um, one of the directions that we want to go in is do direct measurements at Los Alamos and do uh, heavy ion beam type of experiments uh, in the future at EFRIB. And if you combine those two types of techniques, you can learn much more about the nuclear data and, and uh, nuclear structure. All right, so you heard all about fission yesterday, so I don't have to repeat much of this. Uh, all I was going to just point out is, you know, if you look at this cartoon of the fission process, there's a lot of things we can learn using different techniques. So in, in nuclear fission, you have a neutron pinching on a heavy target, and you might want to measure the cross-section of that reaction. So that's what we do with the TPC instrument. 
Um, you create some uh, heavy fission fragments, fission products, and that's what we want to measure with the, with the spider instrument and look at the mass and charge and kinetic energies of the fragments. Um, and then you have the de excitation of the fission fragments with neutron emission and gamma ray emission. Um, with CANU, we measure the neutron, outgoing neutrons. Uh, and with the dance detector, we've also done some work where you tag on fission and you measure the fission gamma rays, multiplicities, spectrum, and so on. And again, I think Stefan showed some of that in, uh, yesterday about gamma ray emission and fission. Okay, so I'm just going to start with the cross section work. Uh, now, of course, cross sections are important in nuclear technology. Um, when it comes to the minor actinides, there are several cases where there's a lack in the data, and I saw some good posters where that's being addressed yesterday. Um, things like plutonium-240 and 242 uh, are produced in, in fast reactors, and you want to know the cross-sections of those. I think it's for plutonium-240 where there was a real weird discrepancy uh, in the cross-section up to a few years ago, where people had done the measurements for sort of um, energies below uh, 100 kV and then other measurements in the fast region, up in the MEV region. Um, and since there were discrepancies between those data sets, there was a place in the cross-section that was just a step, a very unphysical step. Um, so those are the types of things you want to address with the minor actinides. Uh, if you do a fast reactor system, um, in the traditional thermal system, you cared about the thermal region cross-sections and the fast fission spectrum cross-sections. For a fast reactor, you care about the sort of KV to MeV regions. You want to improve the accuracy of the cross-sections there. Of course, if you build an ADS, then you, have, you want to know some of the very high energy cross-sections. Um, and then we have the alternative fuels. If you do the thorium fuel cycle, for example, then you care about other reactions or other cross-sections that you otherwise don't care about. So uh, when I first came to Los Alamos, we did some of the more traditional fission cross-section measurements using uh, parallel plate ionization chambers. So this is the type of chambers that were used back in the 40s already. Um, a very simple design. So you have a gas field ionization chamber. Uh, you have some um, samples in there of uh, your actinite deposits. So you just have your, your deposit and then an anode plate opposite that. You apply a field, uh, fission fragments. You induce fission with neutrons. Fission fragments are emitted and ionizes the gas and you read out a signal. So pretty straightforward. Um, and in this case, you have thick backing, so you're only measuring one of the fission fragments, not both of the ones that you can otherwise get to. Um, so we did neutron time of flight measurements with these uh, instruments uh, at Los Alamos. And we always did them relative to the uranium-235 standard. So that's a common technique. Um, the uranium-235 fission cross-section is thought to be known very precisely from uh, sort of half an MeV up to, I think it's now a standard up to 200 MeV. So at least up to 20 MeV, people claim that it's known to about 1%. So that's a reference reaction you can use. Um, so uh, back in, uh, in the last 10 years or so, we did a bunch of measurements using parallel plate ionization chambers. And I'm just showing some of the cross-sections that we measured. We did uh, Neptunium-237 and then several of the uranium-plutonium isotopes as well as some of the americium uh, isotopes. Um, so, so here you see the uranium series and the plutonium series, and, and this has been published in the past. Um, in most cases, um, this has been measured uh, fairly well in this energy range, so you agree well with the uh, ENDF evaluation, um, but to some certain precision, right? So it depends on how well you want to know this cross-section. Um, and it turns out that for those measurements, the uncertainties depends on who you ask. Um, I, I would say typically you have at least a 3% uncertainty in, in uh, these measurements. Um, people have claimed 1% in the past, and 1% is very difficult to get to. I think um, 2 to 3 at least percent is more reasonable. So 
this is just a list of some of the uncertainties that goes into, into the measurement. Uh, when you do a ratio measurement, you're in 235. Um, the um, standard reaction adds about a 1% uncertainty by itself. Um, and then some of the major ones are knowing what your beam profile is, how uniform your de uh, deposit is. Um, all of those things add quite a bit of uh, uncertainty to the measurement. So 3% uh, is pretty common for the, ones, the type of measurements that I just showed you. So in order to improve on that, we started a project um, together with Livermore seven years ago or so, the Time Projection Chamber project. So that's uh, Verena Kleinrath, uh, one of my graduate students with the TPC. And this is a project where the goal is to reach 1% accuracy in fission cross-section measurements. Um, and the basic idea is to use particle tracking to reduce many of the systematic uncertainties. Um, this technology has become, uh, the TPC technology has become less expensive in, in the last decade or so. So that uh, made it easier to, do, to make this project or have this project. It's still a pretty expensive detector, so uh, it required a major investment. Um, this is some, an instrument with 6,000 channels, and uh, in the past, it would be a very ex expensive instrument to build. TPCs were developed in the late uh, 70s for high energy physics experiments. So typically, they are the size of, of big rooms, and this is a very small detector, as you can see here. So here are some, some uh, mechanical drawings of the, of the TPC. So it consists of an inner volume of about two liters. So it's, again, it's a gas detector. And you have a central cathode where you place your actinide target right there. Um, and for most of the measurements, we use thin backings, car thin carbon films that we have there our deposits on. So in fact, you get both of the fission fragments out of your sample and you measure there's two volumes here, so you can get both fragments in coincidence. Um, so yeah, so this inner part is about the size of a coffee can, and then we use micromegas for the, for the readout. So on each side here is a micromegas plane, and this is how it's pixelated. So it has 3,000 pixels roughly on each side, um, and then uh, each segment here is the, is the corresponds to 32 segments, so that's being read out by one uh, of our electronics cards. Um, so this is a custom digital electronics system, so this is the readout cards, so there's about 200 of those cards to read out all the 6,000 um, channels or pixels. And it consists of 32 amplifiers, uh, 32 digitizers, and then an FPGA card to do the um, signal processing. Um, so you can imagine with 6,000 channels and you're sampling uh, at about 10 nanosecond samples, data rates becomes kind of difficult to handle, so we do at least zero suppression with FPGA technology on board. Um, originally, the plan was to do some uh, more uh, fancy signal processing to do pulsite um, calculations and determine the, the timing of the pulse and so on. Um, and in fact, right now we just use the zero suppression and that's sufficient for the data rates. It's still a bit tricky. So when we have plutonium in the TPC, we have very high trigger rates. This is a self-triggering system. Um, so one of the problems we had recently was just to keep up writing to disk. So we had to come up with some ping-ponging system to, to write the data to disk. Um, some of the other requirements was that uh, eventually we want to do measurements with the TPC and a normalized hydrogen scattering. That's a better standard than the uranium-235 standard. Uh, and the uncertainties there, again, it depends on who you ask, but the uh, uncertainties on that um, cross-section is more like a third of a percent or so. I think it's a fair statement. Um, so in order to do fission uh, fragment measurements and um, do and um, hydrogen scatterings, you have to have a very nice, large dynamic range of the instruments. That was another design requirement. 
So there is a publication out from last year on, that gives you the technical details of the TPC. So Mike Hefner at Livermore is, uh, led the development of the TPC, and Los, Alam uh, and Los Alamos is doing the beam experiments. So we're actually up and running right now. Okay, so this is what the online data looks like when you run with the TPC. So as I said, the, the basic idea is to use uh, particle tracking to reduce systematic uncertainties. So if you have, so this is our online viewer when you have a fission fragment submitted from, so here is the sample, and there's the 3D particle track that we get from a fission fragment. Uh, in this case, it's, ah, in this case, it's not actually a fission fragment. I'm sure you all caught that, right? It's an alpha particle, which is why there's more ionization at the end of the track. So, so we get the full particle tracking, but you also get the Bragg peak, or the Bragg curve of the particle. So you see the specific energy loss along the track, uh, and that helps you distinguish between fission fragments and the uh, alpha particles, for example, that causes uh, background in the measurement. So in the past, you only had the total amount of charge deposited, and now we can look at the Bragg curve uh, as a way of doing particle ID. So the TPC part, so like I said, we have these uh, segmented or pixelated readouts that gives you XY position of the particle track. And then you look at the drift time, uh, that's the time projection part of the TPC to get the C components, to get, to get the 3D track. So that's what this is trying to show. So these are all the individual waveforms for the different pixels that got hit in one event. And you look at the relative timing of those to get the um, third component of the particle track. OK, so the, as I said, the goal is to measure fission cross-sections with sort of 1% accuracy. Yeah, go ahead. How do you get speed zero? Um, yeah, we, it was funny. We didn't figure that out until after we sort of built the TPC. <laughs> so, that, <laughs> so, so what happens is that so you, you know so you, you have a data acquisition system that is fairly slow. It samples at sort of I think it's 10 nanosecond samples. So that's enough uh, time to get good spatial resolution of the of the 3D tracks. But to do the neutron time of flight, you need more like one or two nanosecond timing. So we read out the cathode for that. So we have the micromegas readout that gives us the track. And then we have a trigger from the cathode signal that is faster. Uh, and we use the same system, but we sample the same signal 10 times with individual delays. And then you get the one or, or a few nanosecond timing. So that gives you the neutron time of light resolution. Yeah. That's right. So the idea is that here you, so in the past, you know, you, there were always uncertainties because you didn't know how your sample, how uniform your sample was and how, how your beam pri profile looked like. And if you overlay those two, you can have uncertainties, right, in, in the um, event rates. Here we measure, with the TPC, we measure both of those things. So. Uh, so you have the neutron beam going through the TPC, you ionize the gas uh, from uh, recoils, and you image that, and then you actually measure the beam profile as you do your cross-section measurement. Then you turn off the beam, and you look at alpha decay, and that gives you a map of the uniformity of the sample. Sounds easy. It was very hard, and now in the third year of running this, we're starting, we actually are getting that, that data. Yeah. The what? Cross the crosstalk? Yeah. That's right. So, I mean, there's not much direct crosstalk, but you have, I mean, the, the electron cloud is fairly large for, um, for a fission fragment. So you, uh, when we do simulations of the detector response, we take that into account and, and sort of um, uh, look at, at the diffusion of the electron cloud and see what the, how that affects our signal. Um, but it's, it's actually not much of a problem. I mean, we have more of a problem of, of um, channels dying. Uh, the electronics is somewhat susceptible to, to neutron damage. Um, and 
One of the big questions, there were several questions when we started this. One is what happens if you shoot a neutron beam through a TPC? So people hadn't really done that before very much. Uh, and that worked okay, so we don't really um, see you know, uh, any large backgrounds because of that. And the other question is what happens with a highly ionizing thing like a fission fragment that goes through a TPC? Um, and the answer is that we can um, track those particles quite well, although there's been some weird effects that we had to work out with. Um, you're very sensitive to non-uniformities in the field and the TPC and things like that. Uh, yeah, so, right, so, right, so exactly. So, so what we hope to reduce are the uncertainties uh, associated with the normalization beam profile and, and uh, um, sample uniformity. Um, there's so basically no dead time in the system, which is nice. If you see in the star TPC, you can do thousands of particle tracks in one interaction. So um, dead time is not much of an issue. Uh, and we do better on the fission identification. So in the past, you would have these overlap. In the ionization chamber measurements, you have an overlap between low energy fission fragments and pile up alphas, for example. And now we can much better distinguish between fission fragments and alpha particles. Ah, and then for the normalization, we want to use hydrogen, the hydrogen standard. So go, that brings down that uncertainty to more like a third uh, of the uncertainty of the uranium-235 standard. OK, so you know, it's not very sexy to measure cross-sections with the TPC. So we do other phys physics studies. Uh, and this is uh, the work by Rena Kleinwright that was in the picture here before. So she's looked at angular distributions of fission fragments with this instrument. So it's actually one of the things I hadn't really thought about when we started. I wanted to do ternary particle, ternary fission studies with the TPC, and I'm sure we'll get to that point uh, eventually. But for now, we have a measurement of the uranium-235 um, fission fragment anisotropy. So if you look from 100 kV up to uh, 100 MeV, you, you will see that there is a change in the anisotropy of the fission fragments. So um, for low energies, you have isotropic emission. And then as you increase the excitation energy, um, you get relatively more fragment, forward peaked uh, fragments. So we measure that change and compare that to some previous measurements. There was some really good work done already in the 50s on this. Um, but we extended the energy range. They only did this up to 10 MeV of instant neutron energy, and so now we're going higher. Um, and there is also some work from Antoff on fragment anisotropies. And I, um, we, have looked, we have done some comparisons, but I think that's not published yet. So, so I, I didn't want to show it on this plot just yet. OK, so that was the TPC, and that was the cross sections. and. Um, at the same time when we started this uh, work on improving cross-section accuracies, we also started the uh, prompt fission neutron spectrum project with um, the CANU array. Um, and those two types of measurements kind of go together. If you have a critical system, you want to know the cross-section for fission, um, but that cross-section changes as a function of incident neutron energy, as you just saw. Um, so you also want to know the spectrum of, of uh, neutrons emitted that keeps the chain reaction going. So you measure one and you want to measure the other as well. Um, so to know the neutron spectrum in a critical environment, you need to know sort of the material there that, that affects the spectrum, but you of course have to know the initial prompt fission neutron spectrum as for your starting point. So there's been a lot of work done in the past to measure these things, but there are certain issues with the old measurements. Um, it is something that's very difficult to measure. So in some cases, there are large uncertainties and large discrepancies in old measurements. Um, and sometimes people have underestimated the uncertainties in their measurements. And, and we actually found um, some cases of that as we uh, started working on this problem and did simulations. And you want to know how the prompt fission neutron spectrum changes as a function of incident neutron energy. So there's been some measurements at thermal, for example, and some measurements at fast. And we wanted to do measurements to map that out better from uh, both in the thermal range, but then from 1 MeV up to um, at least 20 MeV or so. And 
So I'll, I'll talk about the experiment where we uh, do these measurements. And I, don't, I think I don't have slide, unfortunately, but um, there's also been some advanced um, modeling and simulation to reproduce old experiments and better figure out whether the backgrounds that they were ignoring mattered or not. And we found that in some previous measurements that people used, they were underestimating the effect of room return uh, in their measurements. So we were able to um, actually correct, in some cases, old measurements. So here's a uh, picture of the prompt um, fission neutron spectrum for uranium-235. And it's uh, shown as a ratio to Max Maxwellian, just to uh, put this on, a, on an easy to read scale. So here are all the data. Uh, Knitter, uh, Staples are some of the uh, well-known measurements that was done in the past at, at a few different energies. So they did, uh, these are the energies, incident neutron energies in these cases. Um, so most of the data is where the peak of the spectrum is, so in a few MeV and, and uh, up to maybe 8 MeV or so. But it gets very tricky to measure the spectrum for the lower neutron energies and for the very high neutron energies. So at high neutron energies, you just run out of statistics. There are very few neutrons out there. And at the lower part, you know, your detector might not be very sensitive to low energy neutrons, depending on what neutron detector you're using. So there's been, and you're also sensitive to background back here. So um, there's been a lot of questions on, on whether the spectrum goes up again at low energies or goes down. And according to the evaluation, it sort of stays flat. So uh, one of the things we really want to address was those two extremes of the spectrum. And these are sort of the target accuracies um, that were set out uh, as they started the CANU project. Um, so uh, these measurements are done with the CHI-NU array. Um, I think the CHI-NU part comes from the name of the matrix of ingoing versus outgoing neutron. And in fact, it's two different detector arrays. So some detectors are better for high energy neutrons, some are better for low energy neutrons. So there is an array of uh, liquid scintillator detectors that does the high energy neutrons well, but has um, sort of a threshold on the lower side uh, where it's difficult to measure below half an MeV or a few hundred uh, keV. And then there's an array of lithium glass detectors that covers the lower energy part of the spectrum. So this is sort of being done as, as two measurement campaigns to cover uh, the, whole, the whole spectrum. Uh, Bob Haight at Los Alamos is the lead for the CANU project. Uh, at least for the next two months, then he's going to retire, and then Matt Devlin will be the new main contact for this. Um, and just as the TPC, this is a collaboration with Livermore. In this case, Los Alamos is the lead, but Livermore is providing the fission tagger detector that is being used in the measurements. Okay, so. Um, so the measurements are done at WNR, so you have incident neutron energies from half an MeV, and you want to go up at least to 30 MeV or higher. Um, and as I said, we have this neutron detector arrays, and then you have the Livermore developed uh, PPAC, that is your fission trigger. So you put your plutonium targets in a PPAC, you trigger on fission, so you have um, an incoming neutron time of flight, you measure the time difference between the accelerator and the PPAC that gives you the incident neutron time of flight. And then the time difference between the uh, PPAC and the neutron detector gives you the outgoing neutron time of flight. So it's a double time of flight measurement. Um, we actually, uh, it was kind of lucky. So we were building a new building for where this experiment is going to be located. And people looked at the background issues. Uh, if you're trying to measure fission neutrons, you also have, and you have a neutron beam coming in, you have a bunch of scattered neutrons all over the place. So in order to uh, reduce that background, we moved shielding as far away as possible. It's always difficult to move the floor away. It kind of is where it is. So they, build, uh, they happen to be building a new building, so we build a large swimming pool in that building. So you take uh, a nice concrete floor, and you, you have a big hole or a pit where the detector sits, and then you have a false floor. So actually, um, that instrument is now sitting on a false floor, and you have less room return from, from the uh, floor under you. 
So this is a multi-year project that says fiscal year 17, and of course, you know, we're not exactly on track, so I think this project is going to go to 18 or, or 19 or so. Um, <laughs> yeah, okay, so the, the motivation is, for, is not for nuclear energy in this case. Um, so I mentioned how many of the measurements were done at certain energies, so for thermal incident neutron energies or certain uh, fast incident neutron energies, this plot is trying to show that. So, so here's literature data in the thermal region, and then there are different measurements at, at different energies between a few hundred kV and a few uh, MeV. Um, and so that's at in select places. In this measurement, we're going to completely cover uh, the fast range from half an MeV up to 30 MeV. So that will give you a sort of a continuous uh, spectrum in that range. Um, and here are some preliminary results. Uh, uranium-235 in this case. So the goal is to do plutonium-239, but 235 is what we know better, so it makes sense to measure that first to, to show that you know what you're doing. Um, so again, this is a, a ratio to Maxwellian but it's going to show us the kind new data compared to some of the previous experiments, and that was our milestone for last year. And this year, um, so the uranium-235 measurements, I think, are completed now, and they're moving over to, to plutonium measurements. And as I mentioned, it's going to be these two campaigns where uh, first the high-energy array and then the low-energy array measurements. And at some point, I'm going to upload this slide. So here are all the references if you're interested in reading up on the topic. And as I mentioned, it is a collaboration. So we have people at Los Alamos, but also at Livermore, and several university people's, people. Uh, Xin Yang is from Livermore. Uh, and I'm sure there's some university people in there, but I'm not sure which ones they are. All right, um, and then I was going to switch over to fission product yield measurements. So, um, so Stefan again talked about fission yesterday and studied fission fragment properties. Um, there are different reasons why you want to do that. One reason is that um, in nuclear technology, you can use the presence of fission products to figure things out. So if, if you have a nuclear device and you find a certain number of fission products, you're dealing 147, for example, you know, you can calculate back how many fission occurred in that device. Um, and so we've done really good measurements of fission product yields, uh, but the relative uh, yield for different fission products changes as a function of incident neutron energy, and that is not well understood. So there are large uncertainties in certain regions. For example, if you do 14 MeV neutrons, uh, the yields have really large uncertainties, again, up to 30 MeV or so. Um, so you can address that problem two ways, or um, several ways, but at least two ways. Uh, you can use ionization chambers uh, with low mass resolution to, to look, how the look at how the mass yield changes in fission as a function of incident neutron energy, and I'll show you some of that. And then we uh, also worked on a 2E, 2V instrument where you get high mass resolution measurements and measure the same thing, but then with lower efficiency, so you have lower count rates. Okay, so here's uh, a measurement from, I'm assuming, Gale, uh, Peter Skilebex, of plutonium-239 showing the mass distribution in fission of plutonium-239. I think that's for incident energy of half an MeV or so. So uh, I'm assuming that the line is the England and Ryder evaluation of fission product yields. Uh, and the points there is data from an ionization chamber. And these measurements are usually quoted as having a four or five mass unit resolution. So that's why you don't really see the same structure uh, in the data as you have in the evaluation. So. Uh, and then you might care about one specific fission product, uh, neodymium-147. So that's located somewhere here on the heavy side. 
And if you take that yield and plot it as a function of incident neutron energy, where we know that the mass distribution changes, um, you can look at the data. So there's some data in, in the few MeV in the few MeV region, and there's data out at 14 MeV, and basically nothing in between. So the big question is, is and as uh, some of the people here with their posters were showing yesterday, you want to know uh, how that yield uh, changes in the region in between. Uh, and if you measure that, you will also have more confidence in the data out at 14 MeV. Um, so here's some, uh, some predictions. And of course, every uh, person who makes a prediction are convinced that they are right. So I've, uh, Mark, uh, Mark Shadwick has made some, some fits to these data and he's convinced that he knows the slope of how this yield changes. And then for some reason, it drops over at 14 MeV. And then one of his colleagues at Los Alamos do another prediction and is equally convinced that it's um, completely flat, that there's no change in the FMEV region. So that's a good reason to actually go out and measure this and figure out what it really is. Um, there's also some good theoretical calculations. So that's another reason why we want to uh, measure fission product yields, because we're getting to a point where people uh, can Hopefully, at some point, we'll be able to predict those yields for systems that we cannot measure. Um, this is from a publication from Peter Moeller uh, back in 2001, I believe, where he's uh, done some of the most advanced studies to, uh, to date on how the potential energy uh, of a fishing nucleus changes as it's being deformed and undergo fission. So by taking those kinds of potential energy um, calculations and combining them with uh, other methods uh, to look at the dynamic aspects of fission, you can actually predict uh, the mass split in fission. So these th uh, plots here are from uh, Arnie Cirque at Los Alamos, where he's comparing um, the amount of total kinetic energy release as a function of uh, fragment mass, for example, and comparing that to some of the measurements we've done with ionization chambers. And it's also predicted uh, mass yields and get actually a, a very good results and good comparison to experimental data and how the data changes as a function of incident neutron energy. So it's kind of a promising time where uh, fission modeling and, and theory is getting better. So it's kind of nice to, to do measurements and try to support that effort. Okay, so ionization chambers is the um, low mass resolution, high efficiency approach to um, to mass yields. So very simple chamber, and again, I think Stefan showed this yesterday. Central cathode with a thin uh, deposit, so you, can, uh, you get both of the fragments out into the detector, and then you have Frisch grids and anodes on each side, uh, and you just measure the kinetic energy of both fragments. And if you do that, and you apply the 2E method, um, you can take, go from two, um, from two energies and translate that into mass yields, so the mass of the two fragments using momentum and uh, nucleon conservation. And if you do that, then you do a measurement where you have a, a neutron time of flight, so you can look at different incident neutron energies. This is for uranium-235. So this is the black points here is a measurement, a recent measurement from Los Alamos. Uh, actually, the student who did this is, is defending her thesis in two weeks, or next week, next week. Um, so these are different incident neutron energies. So it goes, so sort of uh, 2 MeV, 5 MeV, 9, and then up to 14 MeV. Um, and then you can nicely map out the changes in yields going at higher, to higher energies. So for low instant neutron energies, you have almost no symmetric components. You just have very asymmetric peaks. And as you increase the excitation energy, you start filling in the valley here, and you get this um, symmetric component. And that's exactly the type of information that you can use when you model the fission process uh, and improve your theory. And if you plot that different way, in this case for uranium-235, so in this case, this is again mass distributions and the incident neutron energy going this way. So again, you see this sort of valley filling in here, uh, and you can map out those trends. Go ahead. 
Well, so, so what you measure in, in the time scale of an ionization chamber, what you measure are the fragments, kinetic energy after the neutron emission, but before radioactive decay. So you have to make certain corrections. You have to make some assumptions about the number of neutrons that were emitted per fragment, for example. But is that what you're asking? Yeah. Uh, yeah, but it, it's a question of the time scale, right? So you, you measure, um, I mean, if you have a metastable state, I mean, the, the, the decay happens after your measurement, so it doesn't really enter into the uh, technique in this case. We can talk about it afterwards. So, so even if you do a low mass resolution measurement, you can still study these, these trends, as I mentioned. I mean, you might not give, get the change of a very specific yield, but an, on an, um, you can get the overall trends and use that to try to understand individual yields. So here we plot the difference in yield between um, low energy, in this case, I think one and a half MeV, compared to 14 MeV. And what you see is that um, some of the yields uh, are lower at 14 MeV and other um, yields are higher, especially in the symmetric region, you get an enhancement of the yields. So um, some of the work by Mark, Mark Chadwick, for example, he, he made a lot of fits like that to try to figure out which, exactly which fission products would uh, increase with incident neutral energy and which would decrease. So this is certainly valuable information. Um, and, and again, even with lower mass resolution measurements, you get really a nice comparison to um, the evaluation. So this is the England and Ryder evaluations for 14 MeV. Um, so you know, even, even with this uh, lower mass resolution, we compare very, very well to the England and Ryder evaluation, which is kind of the gold standard when it comes to fission yields. Microsoft. So then um, with the fission chamber measurements, another thing we wanted to look at is the correlation between uh, mass and, and um, kinetic energy. And that's mostly driven uh, by the uh, modeling and theory uh, work being done by our colleagues. In particular, uh, Patrick Talou is doing some work trying to use a Monte Carlo technique to um, simulate the de-excitation aspect of fission fragments. Uh, and that code actually starts by sampling from a mass and TKE distribution. So this is uh, what you see here. So here on this axis is the total kinetic energy release in fission. And here is the mass of the fragments. So this, uh, in this 2D plot, uh, I, w I, I don't know if I always refer to this as a, a lung x-ray, or if that was for some of the Gale people that came up with that, but either way. So what this shows you is that for um, the more asymmetric fission events, you have um, a lower total kinetic energy release, and uh, when you go to more symmetric uh, fragments, you get more TKE. Um, and this uh, data is being used to sample from um, as a starting point when you try to figure out uh, neutron and gamma ray emission 
fission, in fission in certain uh, models. Um, and again, and then in Arnie Sirk's work, he calculated this uh, TKE versus mass distributions. And again, we use this data um, to try to, to uh, compare to his results. All right, so I think I'm going to stop here for the first lecture. And then after the break, I'm going to go into the um, spider or the higher mass resolution measurements. So uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them. Pretty straightforward, so. All right. Cool. I have a curiosity about the shape of the flash in the Lucan facility. Mm -hmm. uh, in the first plot, you saw uh, it had like quite large peaks in the hundred of electron volt region. Mm -hmm. So when I sh when, let's see. So when I showed oh, so when I showed the Lewin center, it's actually a count rate from an experiment. So it's actually the flux uh, folded with the uh, fission cross section, um, and the dips you see at the, at 100 kV or so is actually um, absorption absorption resonances in some of our windows and so on. So typically you don't. Well, I mean you see. Uh, Again, I think this was probably because it was a, a count rate, uh, so you're probably seeing the fission resonances showing up at those energies. Yeah.